It is now my pleasure to introduce to you one of our two poetry mentors for this year, Jude Nutter. Jude was born in North Yorkshire, England, and grew up near Han Hanover in northern Germany. Her poetry collections include Pictures of the Afterlife, The Curator of Silence, which received the Ernst Sandin Prize from the University of Notre Dame and the 2007 Minnesota Book Award, and I Wish I Had a Heart Like Yours, Walt Whitman, which received the 2010 Minnesota Book Award. In 2004-2005, she spent two months in Antarctica as a participant in the National Science Foundation's Writers and Artists Program. Twice, Jude has received the McKnight Artist Fellowship for Writers Loft Award in Poetry. In 2008, she was selected by Martine Espada, and this current year, her work was chosen by Mark Doty for this distinction. In selecting her manuscript, Mark wrote, splendidly conceived and artfully written, these poems take occasions that in lesser hands might have been merely nostalgic, confronting the objects a mother has left behind after her death, bending with the father over old photographs, and make of them riveting experiences. The language is honed and humming throughout, and the poet's skill at moving from image to rhetoric is deft indeed. Please welcome Jude Nutter. Thank you. I forgot my watch, so I had to bring my alarm clock, so I don't go over time. It's not set to go off, don't worry. Just make sure I don't go on too long. Um, thank you all for coming. And I'd like to extend a special thank you to Jared, who's worked behind the scenes to um, make all this possible. And thank you, Jared. Thank you, all the participants in the program, particularly the poets that I'm working with this year, and for all your energy and all your poems. And I know we're you know, only a short way into the program, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just honored to be part of this. I'm going to read um, a couple of poems from my third collection and a couple of, of newer poems. This first one is called um, The Insect Collector's Demise. As a child, I was an avid insect collector, but got to a point in my life when I was completely horrified um, by what I was doing. And this is, and there were several poems that revolve around that, that experience of collecting insects and also my, my moving away from that. This one um, is one of the later ones. And there's an insect in here called the ichneumon wasp, which um, I just, if those of you who don't know, it's actually a parasitic wa uh, wasp, which lays its egg next to the wood wasp's egg, so that when its egg hatches, the larva will go into the wood wasp's egg. So it's, a, you know, and then the wood wasp patches and it has a parasite and uh, end of story for the wood wasp. So the insect collector's demise. On mornings free of cloud, the insects mistake my windows for clean platters of sky and knock against them seeking entry. Some make hardly a sound, a sand grain blown against glass, but others Butterflies, for instance, kiss a bit harder and leave behind a whiplash of dust. The mind is a jailer whose job it is to wake us when we are not sleeping, and I am suddenly the child I used to be, running amuck through the garden with my killing jars and my nets, a child so in love with the world that she carried pieces of it everywhere so she would never forget. There was nothing beautiful in such dying, in such bluster, and panic. My net had a mesh as soft as a stocking, and it held the scent of chemicals and breakage, a bitterness like tarnished metal. Every day there were items left behind, torn wings like scraps of propaganda, the leg of a cricket like a dropped hat pin. 
Forget formaldehyde and ethyl acetate. Forget the suspect precarious terrains into which all collectors go for a rare specimen. Imagine what happens to a child in that moment when the matte black pin, thin as horsehair, breaches a cricket's lacquered facade and passes smoothly and without resistance through the body beneath. In the killing jar, the crickets were the worst of all. Their leaps against the glass, the music of someone fiddling with small change in his pocket. What hubris to think the insects loved their lives any less than I loved mine. Each one a verb snatched from the world's mouth. And this is how, how I grew afraid of details, of all the precisions of suffering, and fell in love with landscapes viewed from a distance, where it was everything I could not see that saved me. Where, if there were animals, they were small and clean on the earth's green manicure, sunlight washing like varnish over the backs of black cattle in the fields, sheep falling to their knees to get closer to the sweetest lower stems of the grasses and being rewarded. From a distance, each tree was a green trawl of light too far away to hear the leaves, sad, fricative, or every tiny murder in the dirt. This was a world where even the hooves and the teeth of the horses grazing under the eaves of an oak had never once hurt the grasses, where there were no blast zones of pewter feathers, no flusters of corruption or scandal on the leaves' plain crockery. No ticks dug in between the jackdaw's feathers. Not a single moth like a banner in the jaws of an ant. Not a single ant in a blackbird's beak. At the end of every trouble, I thought, were fields like this. Fields like sunlit platforms. God's failed attempts at imagining paradise. It was everywhere. I wasn't. I could step into it and never arrive. It was always behind me where the grass had already shrugged off the dark kiss of my small boots. And before me, the wrestle of the river, all purpose and no wastage, and I could feel the trout's perfect fit within it where the current grew snug on the inside curve. I have wasted my life trying to enter this promise. I will waste whatever I've, life I have left. In the inch deep darkness of a tree's body, the egg of the Ichnuman, that persuasive burglar, lies next to the egg of the wood wasp. What the world gives, the world then takes away. There's a series of poems in this book about the house I grew up in when I lived in Germany from when I was five to about 17, 18, that was taken over in 1944 by the SS and became part of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. And I go back to Germany every year to do some teaching and some research and have found out in the past six years I've been going back that um, there were over 800 Polish Jews and gypsies in that house um, where I grew up in. And um, I could, I, as a child, I played on the mass graves of Bergen-Belsen. <clears throat> so this whole experience and thinking back on it and becoming an adolescent and a young adult in this environment really had an effect on me. So there's a whole series of poems in this book revolving around that. Um, and this is the first one in the series. It's in sections, it's in five sections, short sections, um, called Growing Up in Bergen-Belsen. One, we all grow up among the dead, but for a child, I had so many. In 15 minutes, less time than it took to kill hundreds, I could ride my white three-speed bicycle 
out through the front gate, over the cricket pitch, down past the pig farm, and into Bergen Belsen. The house I grew up in appears on a postcard mailed by soldiers of the Wehrmacht to their families sometime during their training in 1939. Contained toward the end of the war, 869 gypsies, Jews, and others overflow from the camp next door as Stalin advanced and Hitler panicked and prisoners were shuffled west. Two. The year I began to grow breasts, my body, once private and belonging to me alone, began to belong to others. This was the year boys began to smell strange, like objects that never dried out, like the rank hug of air in the bunker at the end of the street with its odor of concrete and its gun slits flush with the ground, the moist neck of the stairwell in summer. 25 years since the end of the war, and still we had dreams of finding soldiers in full battle dress, with every single bone intact, with their helmets and pistols and bayonets. This was the year my body ran away with itself, and I spoke less and less, while even the thoughts of the boys I ran with began to sweat as they signed up for that lifelong apprenticeship to their wet dreams. I had no knowledge of the soul, but what I did know was ruinous and simple, that the body was punishment enough. And so, as revenge for their every snub and humiliation, this was the year I began to draw my teachers naked, limbs akimbo, floating on the white, unlined pages of my school notebooks. Three. We invent ways to live with the body, and then it is taken away. I grew terrified of touching the pictures of the sick and the dying in National Geographic's and Sunday supplements, washing my hands over and over, opening doors with my elbows, or not at all. It wasn't guilt. The guilt of children is local. Shame over someone else's cat's eye or an aggie dropped into a pocket as it dribbled out of bounds. An apple lobbed on a dare through the school bus window. The countless insects starved by mistake, year after year, locked in jars with parts of the green world they could not eat. Four. Then came the year I stopped eating, convinced that appetite itself was murderous. You quickly discover, said a camp survivor, that you will kill your own child for a crust of bread. Five. The white mare injured in the pasture who lay in the grass on her side and ran like a dog in dreams on the growing blanket of her bleeding. The tadpoles I collected who chewed the tails of the weakest down to tatters a rabbit clipped by the car in front, flopping in the gutter as we roared past, awash in smoke and grit. How could I not believe that our sufferings came back to the fact of the body? Royal of minnows in a hand net, the frantic epilepsy of pale, thin bodies, like the sound of distant clapping. Despite what you might have heard, the birds do sing in Bergen Belsen. They sit in the trees, fat wallets of song. And I grew up with other common myths, lampshades and handbags of human skin, hair of the murdered made into wigs for the whores of the SS guards. And myths are terrible in the way they worry upward in layers like bones or pearls around kernels of truth and hurt. 
one small event, a single word. It's this brush with the truth that gives them their terror and their power. And this was how I came to language, with such fear in my small body. And it would burn down through me like a wick. Look at my time. This is, um, this is a newer poem. <laughs> it's a fairly long one, so I might finish with this one. Um, it's four pages. This is something that um, actually came together. Strange, that you know, have, I consider myself a narrative poet, and often there's these threads that I feel are connected, and I can't quite figure out how, and it's in the writing of the poem that it, it becomes apparent. I, I write to discover where all these things connect. So there were several things. The two, the two main things for this one was I was traveling um, from Dublin, um, going over to visit my brother in the UK, and... Um, I was going through x-ray screening at the airport and I was looking at this picture in National Geographic of a, an ibis, an Egyptian ibis that had been scanned. Um, so you could see all the things inside it that the Egyptians had packed it with. And I, this was, I was thinking I was just completely haunted by this image. And so I wanted to write about that. And later, a couple of weeks later, I was reading an article about some of the things that these people at the airport actually look for when you were going through security screening, certain kinds of behavior. And one of these phrases was they look for people with these, um, ex uh, who are displaying um, emotional leakages, <laughs> <laughs> which are things like, you know, smiling too much or walking too fast or, you know, blinking too much. So I've got to get that into a poem. So there were these other things that came to me, but. These, then these two things blended together, the extra, and all these things with the, um, the emotional leakages and the x-rays. So this is what happened with, with this one. And it went in a direction that really surprised me, as you know, poetry usually does. So it's called Still Life with Full Moon and Ibis. You know the procedure. You're queuing in a maze of stanchions and nylon straps, clutching whatever you have not checked through to your final destination. All the things you believe you couldn't live without should your jet go down on its short belch across the Irish Sea. And this is evolution's greatest triumph. This belief each one of us carries that will be a survivor. And there you are with your belt removed, your boots untied, with your toothpaste and hair gel clearly on display inside the lung of a Ziploc bag, funneling forward, prepared to pass through the dark gate of the x-ray, distracted by a photo in your National Geographic of a mummified ibis passed through a scanner by scientists in Montreal. How relaxed and almost smug it seems, deep in its snug wrappings, with its legs extended and the flex of its long neck folded carefully back on itself, and its body, with every organ but the heart removed, packed with snails for the journey into its afterlife. Along the queue's home stretch on your left is a wall of mirrored glass, which hides, you know, officials in uniform, skilled at spotting, or so you have read, all manner and variety of dubious behaviors. And really, it could be any one of you, sleep deprived, anxious and faffing with your carry-ons, in mourning, in love, overdressed for the weather, making lists and annotating maps and flinging little argots in your native language. Because really, aren't all of us, all our lives, individuals in places we do not belong? In the stretch of the mirror's tableau, the world is what it is. And you think of your mother, dead now, too many years, as if fewer years wouldn't be too many about how, when you were a child, she would hide between the soil and the lowest shelves of the rhododendron, every chaffinch and siskin and sparrow that launched from the feeder 
and mistook the reflection of the world for a continuation of the world while you sat at the table in the kitchen eating breakfast or drawing and coloring your way toward a happiness of your own making. Even the colors themselves, their names, sap green, scarlet black, lamp yellow, a world already half created. Look, your mother would say, whenever you were together out in the garden, in the window, in the window's mirror, a portal of sky, a fixed portion of lawn, and the dark green beckonings of the neighbors Leilandi. Across the glass, smudges like watermarks and a spore of feathers. Look where the birds pass through to that blue on the other side, to a sky undamaged, without flaw. You can't say why when your mother belongs to the past, all your memories of her are always in front of you. There was your first night on earth without her. Full moon, tide on the ebb. When you walked that widening wet cuff of sand as the waves unzipping along their length withdrew and handed over torn seine nets and plastic and a single tennis shoe. You remember the empty palms of clams and astarte, scattered packets of devil's purse, slick blades of kelp. Then a lunge of wind and the high complaint of a shorebird startled from sleep. And from the fields, a rumor of coconut from gorse in full bloom. And the wet sand before you, an endless corridor in which the lamp of the moon was being carried, always ahead of you, keeping a constant distance. Where else, you think, would she be? She taught you that even the common birds of the hedgerow and the garden inherit a life beyond this one. That the things you want to believe are things you need to believe. She gave you the world inside this one which makes you smile until you remember those officials in uniform trained to decipher, or so you've read, all manner and variety of emotional leakages. Those of you blinking too fast or scanning the queue or curling a lip like Elvis. <laughs> really, who among us, marooned in reverie, can't help sneering? or smiling like that unknown model who became the Mona Lisa with just the corners of our mouths curved like plump commas. But there you are anyway, smiling and rocking back and forth in your thick-soled, unlaced boots, preoccupied, taking notes, building a shelter for everything you love ahead of its destruction. And what would you say if they singled you out, if you were yanked from the queue and jostled to a table in some small back room. Because anything you could say would sound like a threat. I'm writing a poem, you'd say. I'm thinking about the afterlife. <laughs> you'd say, did you know the Egyptians packed mummified ibis, birds sacred to Toth, moon god, god of divine speech, keeper and recorder of all knowledge, with snails? <laughs> I know, you'd say, sliding your notebook toward them, and I can show you where the dead go. How am I doing for time? I'll do a, should I do a short one, yeah. one more? And we'll do, um, trying to think what I feel in the mood for. I'll do this one. This is called From the Mouth to the Source. It's a short poem in this Walt Women book. It's, um, it's my father was a, called up for the British Army and fought in World War II. So some of these poems are, come from stories he's told me. <clears throat> this is, um, came from something he, he once shared with me, from the mouth to the source. 
It drills right through him, the force spinning him around so that he dances a full pirouette as it enters his left breast just above the nipple. A veteran, after six weeks of war, you can put five shots inside a four-inch circle from 200 yards. Muzzle velocity, 2,440 feet per second. Chamber pressure, 19.5 tons per square inch. He was 50 yards away, and all it took was this one bullet that was shipped across the channel, trucked to the front from a port in France, and loaded just that morning from its stripper clip, and then cradled all day in the chamber of your rifle. Before you recover from the recoil, he is on his back, and it's cold enough to see the reach of his breathing forced from his mouth in great streamers growing shorter and shorter as he settles himself deeper into the dirt. You feel it, like someone sitting down on the edge of a bed when you are sleeping. It feels real the way death in a dream feels real, and then in daylight, when you wake, more real still. <coughs> then, in profile, the slack, easy hollow of his open mouth like a beggar's bowl, and you, for now, with everything still left to give. And across the channel, the girl who worked on the bullet has finished her shift in the factory and just now walked through the door of her tiny flat in Coventry. Nightfall. You and your platoon are out of your slits on the move. The girl in Coventry pulls her curtains puts bread on the table, and butter, and jam, if she's lucky. She's too tired to bathe, and the dead German soldier, a small part of the darkness now between you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>